Welcome to Trending in Education. This is Mike Palmer, back home safe in Brooklyn after a wonderful trip to Austin, Texas for South by Southwest EDU, where we wound up opening up the podcast stage at the conference. I did a panel with Terry Givens, Dan Harrison, and Tarlin Ray, folks I collaborated with over the last two years in particular. Dan and I have just launched a podcast called Inside Jackson Station. You can find it at InsideJacksonStation.com. Tarlin and I have been doing a Lessons Learned from Sports podcast called Running It Back. You can find that at RunningItBack.fm. Both of those pods are available everywhere you listen to podcasts. And of course, the OG of them all, Treading in Education, still going strong, 450 episodes in Great time down in Austin. Look for us out at other live events. We'll be trying to find the right speaking engagements, podcasting opportunities, live panel events, you name it. Thanks as always for listening. And with no further ado, let's take you to our live panel held in early March at South by Southwest EDU. Welcome, everyone. This is going to be an episode of Trending in Education, which is a podcast I've been doing since 2016. We've done over 450 episodes. Check it out, trendingined.com. Uh, it's a fun conversation. All three of these folks have been guests on my podcast. That's now turned into a couple other shows that we're going to talk about a little bit today. Two years ago, we were supposed to kick off the podcast stage here in 2020. And as you all know, the mayor of Austin had other plans. We wound up not coming until today. So it is pretty amazing to be able to finally come across the finish line. It's great to be in front of a live audience, which is fantastic. I'm joined by kind of a miracle panel. This, these are my people who, uh, who I really have worked with a bunch over the last two years. So maybe beginning with, with Terry. Terry, you want to introduce yourself? Yes. So this is Terry Gibbons. I'm currently in Menlo Park, California. But later this week, I'll be heading to Montreal, Canada, where I'm a professor at McGill University. And Mike and I, not only have I been on this podcast, but we did a podcast ourselves called This Week in Higher Education. It still has a lot of relevant content. If you want to go back and take a look, actually, it's kind of fun to go back and reminisce because we would do our little COVID check-ins. Yeah. And in any case, I'm a former professor at University of Texas at Austin, so put them horns, and I'm happy to be here. Awesome. And Terry's written a couple books that we're going to be talking about. Another author on the stage, Dan here. Dan and I went to college back in the 20th century together. And you, uh, and, uh, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Mike. I'm Dan Harrison. And as Mike said, we went to college together back in the late 80s and, and early 90s. Really thank Mike for a lot for bringing this all together. I'm a sociologist and I currently teach at Lander University in Greenwood, South Carolina. And I've written a couple of books, one of which is available in the bookstore here. It's called Live at Jackson Station, and that's the one that we'll be talking about today. Uh, my book that I wrote before that was called Making Sense of Marshall Ledbetter, which was published in 2014 by the University uh, Press of Florida. So the Live at Jackson Station book is about this kind of wild blues bar in uh, Hodges, South Carolina, the hinterlands of, of South Carolina, basically. And it was a very cosmopolitan, tolerant place, a very blue space in a sea of red, in a sea of, of uh, a surrounding sea of, of very red conservative culture run by a couple of gay guys, Gerald Jackson and his long-term boyfriend, uh, Steve Bryant. And for about a decade, uh, Jackson Station was known as being the premier blues club in the state of South Carolina, possibly the Southeast. He just had amazing blues acts uh, played there. Nappy Brown, the uh, R&B crooner from the 1950s, he, his career was resurrected in part due to Jackson Station. You had Drink Small, who was a local South Carolina blues artist, played there a lot. You had, you had Fats Jackson, an amazing saxophonist from Atlanta. Um, other types of music played there. Widespread Panic, the jam band, the Widespread Panic, uh, played there nine times. They came over from Athens, which Georgia, which is about 70 miles away. And for about a decade, it was just this really cool, amazing, inclusive space. In April, 1990, the owner, Gerald, was viciously attacked by a maniac in the parking lot with a bush axe and left for dead. The axe went four inches deep inside his skull. 
And, and the book is essentially a cultural history, a, a social history of this place, this space, Jackson Station. And I interviewed 65 people who had some connection to the place. And it's really a story about Southern culture, cosmopolitanism in a place which is usually very kind of bigoted and hostile to people who are different. Anyway, so I've been working on this project since about 2014. The book came out in 2021. Mike got wind of it when I was on the Dennis Ball show, yeah. um, of all things. And then Mike reached out to me and to see if I wanted to be on training in education. We did. And then we have since spun off this podcast called Inside Jackson Station. So we kind of take you inside Jackson Station. We interview the musicians and other people who went there and we intersplice some audio from inside the club. And so that's available at InsideJacksonStation.com. We're going to come back to all that. That's yeah. good. And then as if he needs introduction, I guess you do. This is Tarlin, Tarlin Ray. Uh, great seeing everyone. Tarlin Ray founded and co-host of Running It Back with Mike. I like to call that, that my side hustle. I am the senior vice president for Big Future for the College Board. Truly, this is fun to be here. I'm not used to doing a pod with Mike where I'm not in my pajamas at 6.30 a.m. Pacific time. Yeah. The reason we started running it back was it was a way for us to connect at a really crazy time during COVID. March 2020, I ruptured my Achilles. I'm in LA, can't move around. And the last dance came out for those who like sports and in the Chicago Bulls. Mike and I had worked together multiple times in various in a company called Kaplan. We had one of the most dominant teams called Score Lords in the Chelsea Peer League, where we did come in second, so it wasn't that dominant basketball. And it was a way for us to just connect. And I'd been on training and education and said, why don't we just do a pod and let's talk about the episode. So we did that four times and said, you know what, there's a lot of richness to sports. And this is an education conference. I get a lot, of play sports my whole life. I get a lot of education from not the actual game, but the way that people interact, leadership, management, grit, overcoming adversity. And so we thought we'd not only talk about sports, but run it back to sports moments to see what we can get out of those sports moments. So that's what we've been doing for two years. I think we're 45 plus yeah. pods in. We just got new hoodies. New uh, hoodies. Which, which uh, will soon be available to fans. And um, so no book out. I got the political scientists, the sociologists, and just the dude yeah. who likes talking about sports and trying to blend that into a world where I constantly am reading nonfiction. I'm reading management books. I have a larger team to run. I'm trying to apply that, even if you're not into sports, into just the way to interact with people, life, and to elevate your EQ as well as your IQ. Yeah. One common theme, I think, among all three of these panelists is storytelling. One of the things I think we've noticed a lot is that sports is providing almost like a mythic narrative for us to kind of work out all of the psychic stress that we're going through these days. And a lot of the topics that we wind up talking about, you know, most recently we were talking about the Rooney rule and the Flores suit for those of you who are following, you know, Brian Flores sued the NFL. Sports in some ways is a microcosm of the broader world around us. My wife, I, I call her sports curious and she is a fan. Like she, she likes listening to the show. So, you know, more for the narrative, more for those elements. I know Terry, you're a big sports fan and we haven't really heard about your books. So I don't know if you can bring sports into your books, but that, that was a lame <laughs> attempt at a segue. But right. yeah, yeah. Sports, yes, because one of the things I discuss in my book, Radical Empathy, is my career running track at Stanford University, which lasted only two years. But no, sports actually is a, a very important component of my life. And Radical Empathy is more about how we can bridge our racial divides and work with each other in, in ways that are more collaborative by understanding each other's stories. But storytelling is such a critical component of understanding sport and education and all of that. And so I use sports in my own way to help people understand how, you know, even though sports gives many of us opportunities, especially from the African-American community, it also has its own issues. So um, actually I was at the following what's happening in the NFL ruining rule. Mm -hmm. And it, it speaks to these broader issues. The reason I wrote the book Radical Empathy is to help people understand structural discrimination. And the NFL is a prime example of structural discrimination because you saw it happening in real time when they said, oh, yes, we're doing the Rooney Rule. We're bringing in the, these guys to interview. 
and they had already made a decision. I've run into that many times. I mean, I, I've decided I'm no longer going to talk to headhunters because they'll work with a client who says, oh, bring me a black candidate. So, you know, they'll reach out. Hey, I've had this happen over and over where I'll be asked to apply for a position. And then it's obvious that I'm the, the black candidate or the woman candidate or the black woman candidate. There's clearly no desire to even consider me. It'll be like a very brief interview that has no substance to it. And it's obvious that the people who are interviewing me didn't even bother to Google me in advance. But this happens at higher end more generally, because that's why I tell people it's all about networking. Often the candidate for a position was chosen before the job ad goes up. So yeah, that's a lot of what's going on there. So to bring it together, the Rooney rule doesn't work because people will find ways around it. And that's true for so many other rules that try to break down structural discrimination. Yeah. I recently had Terry back on trending in education to talk about her more recent book. Uh, you want to catch us up a little bit on that as well? Sure. So the first book, Radical Empathy, came out about a year ago. It just came out in paperback. So please go ahead and get a copy. Radical Empathy, Finding Path to Bridging Racial Divides. But the other book, it really goes more in depth into what structural discrimination really is. So it's called The Roots of Racism, The Politics of White Supremacy in the U.S. and Europe. And the reason I connect the U.S. and Europe is because, you know, I'm a Europeanist as a political scientist. I've been doing this for 20 years, starting out with studying the radical right in Europe. And when I tried to start studying the radical right and racism about 25 years ago, people in Europe kept saying, oh, you know, you can't talk about racism in Europe and racism doesn't exist. But there was a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment. I mean, I did see racism too, but I was like, okay, let's look at anti-immigrant sentiment and study these political parties. And back then people would tell me, oh, the radical right's just a flash in the pan. You know, they're not going anywhere. Here we are 20 years later and the radical right is very much ascendant and everywhere. Um, so the bigger issue there is how, even within the field of political science, we don't look at our history. I mean, we don't understand that a lot of these disciplines started, including sociology. How many times have we just ignored Du Bois in sociology? And yet these people, you know, there were all these trailblazers who were doing this work in political science, sociology, who we just ignore and don't talk, talk about our Ralph Bunch and, and Mirza Tate. And so we pretend that these disciplines are age historical, but the reality is that they had very racist beginnings around the time of eugenics, you know, the, the timing of all of this was in the time of this kind of scientific racism in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And that's why it's so important to understand how race plays a role in all of these different things. And that we, the ideas about race were being shared and still to this day are being shared back and forth. It's happening right now in real time with the Republican party connecting with Putin and other far right. Uh, you know, gear builders in the Netherlands, you know, the, and, it, and the thing is, we all sat there and understand it's, it's a combination of racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, you know, anti-LGBTQ. I mean, all of these things are very much intertwined as you're seeing across the country. And this is a huge issue for education, these anti-LGBTQ and trans student bills. That's why it's important to understand what's happening in Europe. We can see that with Ukraine right now and yeah. African students who are being abandoned. It's all intertwined. So I'm trying to get my field and as well as other d disciplines to think about how racism is intertwined in every single aspect of this world. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good read. I definitely recommend it. it and the podcast episode is a nice entree into it too. So if you do want to check out the trending and ed conversation that I had with Terry. And, and I would just say that her research is just so relevant today with everything that's going on. I mean, she mentioned structural discrimination and racism. And there's people out there who don't want us even to like use those that term mm -hmm. who just pretend that it doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to pick up a little more on Jackson station, perhaps as a, a model, you know, it's, it's somewhat idealized now since it's gone. Yeah. But it did, I did, I got that very much from your book. And then as we were talking to the, the musicians who played there, there, there was a sense of, of tolerance and ecumenical is a word that comes up a lot. No, you're exactly right. Jackson station was known for being a very diverse place. Um, Gerald and Steve. Two gay guys at a time when being gay was illegal in, in South Carolina. It is technically, like, they still have a buggery statute on the, on, on the books in South Carolina, which is amazing to think that they, it's still a felony crime, according to the South Carolina Code of Laws, punishable by five years in prison or a $500 fine. They don't enforce it anymore because of what's happened at, at the federal level. And so... You know, Gerald Jackson really is the protagonist of the book. He was born and raised in small town, South Carolina Hodges, and then he 
went off to the Vietnam. He was in the Vietnam conflicts and then came back and wanted to open up this blues bar. And so I think partially because he had himself experienced such uh, prejudice and bigotry, and he, he was out. I mean, he was out when he came back from the Vietnam uh, War and could care less what people thought of his, uh, his sexual orientation. But he was just known as being very, uh, a very charismatic and gracious host who had a barman's ability to speak to anybody. And everyone was welcomed at Jackson Station, ostensibly. People tell me that Jackson Station didn't know race, it didn't know class, it didn't know gender, it didn't know sexual orientation, and you had all these different sort of subcultures in the area who would claim the bar as their own, and for the most most of the time, they, they intermingled quite nicely there. Mm. Some people have criticized me a little bit for perhaps, you know, idealizing that story a little bit too much, and that criticism is well taken. I never went there myself, and so I, I really don't know for sure, how diverse and tolerant it was. But I just have to report what people have told me. But Jackson Station was a place where it was all about opening yourself up to new and different experiences, to having interactions and conversations with people who were different from you, different from you racially, ethnically, class-wise. Even musically. Musically. And I think it is a good model for thinking about sort of where we are as a culture and a society today, because today it seems like we're just so siloed and everyone is kind of off in their own little tribe. And there, it, there are very few attempts for crossover conversation and reaching out to people who are different from yourself. And that's what it was like. Uh, just Jackson a State. couple of quick notes. It's in a reclaimed railroad depot from the 1870s. The structure is still there. And we're toying with uh, creating a metaverse version of Jackson Station. So anyone out there... Put on your goggles. ...developing that type of stuff, it'd be pretty pretty fun to get there. Tarlin. Um, Before you ask, there are some elements of that, what you're describing, Terry and Dan, it just in sports. It's not full range, but imagine groups of people getting together that are from different backgrounds and have to figure out how to communicate in the locker room. They're listening to different music. They have different tastes, different interests, different perspectives. And you got to come together to accomplish something. To me, that's no different than as you look in companies and organizations, everyone's supposed to be rowing together because this is what the company's about. But it's you're seeing that's, on, that's being dismantled. They expect companies and organizations to stand for something. When you're dealing with the team, they're all coming from different perspectives. So you have to figure out how to reach people. Terry, you're being up very upfront talking about race, it is really hard to do and not something it's a little forbidden to do that within an organization. So you talk around it, but also need to make sure you can reach people. You don't want people to agree with everything that you stand for, but you have to spend time and have space mm -hmm. to understand. For me, that has to happen in sports. You do not win, period, with talent unless people trust each other. And trust only happens from having very tough conversations. It may not be a conversation about race, sexual orientation, but it's about something where they find a, a common ground to then go off and win. That's why I get so much out of it. And then I, you, uh, Robin is, is sports curious. My two daughters, my wife, they are sports nothing. Yeah. My wife, I can't imagine for 20 years, she's been able to watch some games with me and literally is looking at just images and keeps nothing. So I just appreciate being able to talk to Lacey and Ben and Jeff that really are here to talk about sports. Yeah. But I truly am trying to connect with them to get them at some point that it opens up a different conversation. Right. And maybe it's a little, it's a easier opener. And some of the conversations are out there today that become so politicized yeah. and fraught. Right. And as, a, as a sociologist, and I actually teach a class called Sociology Sport occasionally. So well, Osseo Sports is my favorite class. That, yeah, even better. But I really like thinking about about sports because it really is, as you say, a microcosm of society. So everything which is going on in society happens within the sports world. It's a very condensed, focused sort of a way. And so you have issues of racial stratification, class stratification, sexual orientation, and then also all the other kind of teamwork stuff that you're talking about. So props off to you. I think you you're, you really are, you know, hitting on something very important tonight. I haven't listened to many, but I will be listening to more of the running and back. And Maybe we can all do one. Right, right. Absolutely. Sociology of sports. And, um, Tarlin, really, I just wanted you to promote some of our episodes. So like, what were some of the, <laughs> some of the topics that we talked about? Cause I was thinking Simone Biles, Naomi Osaka, Mahmoud abdul Raouf. Like, I felt yeah. like we covered a lot of interesting, like stories that don't necessarily maybe get as much coverage. And also it's frequently tied to when something bubbles up in the collective consciousness because sports stars are media stars. 
Yeah, we did. For those who don't know, we did Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, formerly Chris Jackson of LSU. He was in the '90s one of the first athletes not to stand for the go out out for the national anthem. So everyone knows Colin Kaepernick. But we wanted to run it back to him to see what happened to him and to the impact on his career. Uh, we talked about Simone Biles, who is the greatest uh, gymnast ever. And for people to question her heart, her dedication, because she had twisties at the time to say that she wasn't, didn't have the strength of the grit when she had powered through multiple injuries. And why, what was, why were people thinking, and was there some race that was it about that she was a female? We touched on mental health, I'm Naomi Osaka and her strength, which people, because you can't see the injury, does it, is it really the same thing? And people not giving space and grace to that you know, it was emotional for me, but Tiger Woods is a challenging sports, an athlete, but he was a poster on the wall. Everyone needs posters on the wall of people that you can look up to that have challenged to be the only one, one of the first people, obviously Lee Elder and others were before him, but I, we in our pod, I did an ode to Tiger creating these Sunday moments where I was always in front of the TV watching a sport that I didn't grow up playing, but now I play. And also Tiger provided you with a really easy Halloween costume. He did. For years, red, red shirt, putter, and black pants is so easy to do. Yeah. Um, and then more recently, as we try to not, we try to provide a perspective, I just, the, what's happening in NFL kind of pisses me off. And I, I love, we get a lot of feedback. So we have People in my organization, friends that will write long emails because they're starting a conversation. We hope that the pod starts a conversation. But I just frustrated by what's happening in the NFL with Brian Flores because I just don't understand how you, you fire a winner. Mm -hmm. And when you're winning, it just, it just doesn't compute for me, one. And then two, how there are individuals that are coordinators now that are winning. And if you just map up, match their careers and sort of their stats, how they're not getting jobs and other people are. And then you have all the symbolic politics around the NFL with the end racism slogans and yeah. things on the helmet. The page and Patriots has never noticed the, the number of so, teams so. that are red, white, and have red, white, and blue in their logos, yeah. their colors. There's a meaning for that. So it's the a, end racism zone. Yeah, it's fraught. But hopefully, and we're always open to hearing suggestions. It's just a way, it truly is a release for me personally, but it's a way for me, if you're into soap operas, which I never watch, this is like a mix of the soap opera, a way to have um, topics that should be more approachable and everyone can sit around. Most people that are into sports center on the table talk about sports, but you can start to infuse that conversation with something a little, a little spicier to see how people react. And so that's the point. And we also did one on Scotty Pippen. His book is a little hard to read. So we... Palmer and I like to talk about ear reading. If you do audible, do it at 2X. It may, your ears may bleed and you may get a little dizzy, but it's a better way to read that book. It's a slight fall risk. I actually wound up falling over listening. <laughs> it's it's hard, so hard to do, but th that's the point. So anyone, just come. If you're into sports, explore. We're not into focusing on what's happening now. And my daughter's always asked, why aren't you covering your Super Bowl? I'm like, you have thousands of people talking about the score. Mm. There's something interesting that came out of it that can be topical, that can relate to the way we should look at the world, the way you should look at managing teams. That's where we're, that's where we're anchoring. And you should, if, I wish everyone could be a fly on the wall to our text messages during the week. Mike and I, what are we talking about? And he goes, one word. Yeah, I don't know. It's like this random, it's very, it, there's a lot of prep going into stream it. Stream of consciousness. Yeah, stream of consciousness. But, yeah, yeah. but it, I appreciate you, Mike, for yeah. giving, giving the space to do it and allowing for us just to breathe and, and go in directions that it's going in. Yeah, and, and I kind of wanted to pivot in that direction to where, for me, my day job is more podcasting and producing these types of things for people. And it's been hugely therapeutic for me going through the pandemic while having conversations with folks like the ones you see here. And I would encourage all of you to, to try to tap into that capability. You know, I'll do it all from my home. It's all in Zoom. And you really work on your ability to have conversations. I was joking with Tarlin. It's almost like a mix of executive coaching and just kind of shooting the shit with a friend. It's almost like a therapeutic function. And, and I think something new has been unlocked, particularly through the pandemic. When you think about these new media formats and how easy it was for me to work with Terry, who was in Montreal and California, Dan's in South Carolina, Tarlin's in LA, you know. There, were, there was a little bit of snobbery within podcasting where you had to be in the huddled in a hot booth together for it to be like legit. 
I think that's pretty much gone now. And these formats are really emerging and evolving. And especially if you think about them from an educational context, you know, all the demographic data is showing that, you know, podcasting is growing, particularly among younger demographics, especially if you look at Spotify and YouTube, which, you know, are predominantly listed major part of your listenership is 18 and under 25 and under. And those are also areas that are growing. And then at the same time, you see a lot of growth among the older set. Like I'm becoming increasingly interested in doing podcasts and capturing conversations with folks who are older. Uh, you know, I, I came around to podcasting a little bit late in that my, my dad passed away right before I started doing it. But if I had more of an opportunity to record with them, it's Regret's a good thing. Daniel Pink just wrote a book about it. Regret's a good thing. But that is something that I do regret. I wanted to pivot to education because, you know, each of you also. That's why we're here. Wear education <laughs> hats. Like you're, you're you. the opposite of the side gig is, I guess, the main gig, the main hustle. But Terry, can you talk a bit about what things, what's it been like just managing your professional life over the last few years? I know you've been going through, everyone's been going through a lot, but I, since I know your story, I'd love to, to hear a little more from you on that. Yeah. So a year ago, a year ago, two years ago, I was getting ready to launch my new company, the Center for Higher Education Leadership at South by Southwest EDU. We were doing it. We actually did end up doing our shark tank with Goldie Bloomistic from the Chronicle of Higher Education, that it was a big blow, you know? Yeah. We were all ready to launch these new online courses and had all, yeah, and then just everybody was consumed, myself included, with COVID. And so we, st instead of just launching the company as we planned, we launched a series of podcasts. So yeah, at the time, they were live webinars that we recorded, of course, and just trying to be of service to higher ed, to talk about going online or teaching, how to stay safe. I had my, my first guest was a friend of mine who's a virologist at Portland State University, Ken Stedman. So we, we brought in people who could be of service to people as we were trying to get through those first few months, which extended into, of course, a couple of years. A little more than a year ago, I saw that McGill University had an opening and they had recently launched a new strategy on to address anti-Black racism at that institution, which at the time had only eight or eight or 10 Black faculty out of 1700 and had a very strong goal of increasing those numbers over the next 10 years. But at the time, you know, I was even interviewing virtually. Uh, luckily, I'd been to Montreal previously and things are a little uncertain about crossing the border and so on. So it's been, you know, I did end up teaching virtually in the fall. I am back in the classroom now, which actually is working out. I think because of the fact that I've been, you know, I mean, I think Mike and I did our own, you know, web live cast, which we put into our podcast this week in higher education again, to be of service to, to higher ed and to really try to stay on top of those topics. One of the things that has been interesting to me is people keep saying, oh, all of this going online, everything is going to accelerate innovation in higher ed, but you know, I'm not necessarily seeing it. So at the really top notch R1 institutions, they're like, okay, we're back to normal. And part of the reason for that is infrastructure. You know, I'm teaching in a classroom at McGill University. It's a normal classroom, you know, and I have to bring in my own laptop and camera. I use my AirPods so that I can walk around the classroom. So the students who are, we're trying to do hybrid in a classroom that's not set up for hybrid, hoping that the students can hear the other students through my AirPods. And it's really a, an interesting situation that for the, the university is, everybody's been basically trying to tread water these last two years. Now that many institutions are back to close to normal, they are trying to figure out what does this mean? And I think for most big R1 institutions, they're just, they're still at ground zero for the most part. They're just starting to really think about what does this look like? How can we continue going hybrid? They all have online offerings, but you know, it's set up in a very different way. And it's not meant for me to be able to walk, necessarily walk into a classroom and do hybrid or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it's, you know, the, the amount of investment that's going to be needed to really catch up to all of this is just staggering. When mm -hmm. you think of how in the cost of updating everyone, oh, we should have these fancy classrooms. Oh, well, those cost money. Right. And most, especially the public institutions are struggling financially, despite the fact that places like UC are seeing record admissions, just because we get all these admissions, the funding for higher ed is still on a downward spiral. Um, they're having to raise more money to do things and they just don't have the bandwidth to do all of this innovation. Mm -hmm. And then Terry, you're also, you know, you are trying to 
increase the diversity of, of the faculty at McGill? I know you're relatively early on in that conversation, but any perspective on, you know, A, first getting that type of job, how many of them are out there? Also, I know you're looking for networking opportunities, even though you couldn't be here in person, but, but can you talk a little more about, about that side of what you're doing? Yeah, it's all about networking. And what I'm trying to help the people at McGill understand is part of the reason they don't have a large number of black faculty is because of course, for years and years that when you have the top faculty who are mostly white males, they don't have the networks. And so it's the way I got jobs in higher ed was always about networking. And so that I know that's the, the critical thing. And that means that people have to be willing to go outside their comfort zones. And when you're at you know, your annual conference, you know, go talk to some of the black faculty. Because, you know, the problem is that the percentage of black faculty, I talk about this in my book, Radical Empathy, it's not grown. Um, and so what ends up happening and what I'm trying to avoid at McGill is we just go, okay, well, they have a really good black faculty member there over at tier two university. We're going to go coach that person who's doing tier one right. like type work. And instead we need to be building the pipeline. So one of the things I've been trying to do is just connecting with, you have to start an undergrad, get kids interested in, the, in going to graduate school. And then you have to, and we do that in clinical science. We have several programs, including the Rob Hutch program for undergrads to, you have an experience doing research and thinking about going to graduate school, but we need, those need to be a huge yeah. program. They're tiny right now. Yeah, yeah. And so anyway, teaching people how to network, how to find the scholars, how to reach out, how to. And then the next big challenge is once they get in, helping them, you know, retention. So I just, my big project I'll be talking to my provost about in the next few weeks is um, retention because we are not in general in higher ed, don't do a very good job on retention because we just assume, oh, everybody, you know, and it's true. People are scrambling for these jobs, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't help them succeed. I mean, it's sad. Certain institutions like Yale and Harvard and Princeton, they're, they're known that they bring in, it's like a five or six year postdoc because you go in as a junior faculty, basically pretty much geared, well, it's certainly, it's at least very unlikely to get tenure. And so you have right. a plan on what your next step is. And this is not the way higher ed should work. I mean, I experienced that at UT Austin as well, where the expectation was if you wanted a raise, you had to go out and get an, an offer. Well, so if I'm going to go out and get an offer, do the work to interview, I'm going to go get another job, which is what <laughs> I did. I'm not going to put all this time and effort into building my CV. And, and so we don't reward, um, well, I should say, this is another very restriction of discrimination comes in is it's not that we don't reward, you know, longevity and willingness to stay, you know, we reward who we want to reward. And so the, all the goodies and then now chairs go to the old white guys who've been there forever. And then the young up and comers who are working their butts off and doing all the service work get very little. And I'm sure Dan will be very happy to verify what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, it does remind me a little bit of the Rooney rule there too, where, you know, what are your incentives? How do you actually move the needle? Is it just getting them into your university? Are you retaining them? What, what does success look like? And I would actually say we have to go even beyond the undergrads and look at, at even middle school. Schoolers, high schoolers and plant the seeds that early on mm -hmm. that could yeah. um, I mean, we would love to see more African-American professors, Latina professors at our school. And it's really hard. It's really hard to get people to come for what we can pay, you know, to right. be honest, because we're a small public school in South Carolina. I just, think related to that is, is just any of your perspective. I know also you have a lot of takes on the social sciences and sociology. Yeah, it's a really interesting time. I think it's a scary time a little bit to be in, in education, especially in higher ed. I'm looking forward to the uh, panel discussion tomorrow, which is all about um, alternative pathways to college. And as a, as a college professor, uh, that makes me a little bit nervous, like what there's alternative pathways to a college education. But I fear that the university system has become this very stale sort of a place and that a lot of the creativity in education now is coming from potentially from the private sector. Mm. We're seeing the drop off in college enrollment. We have a million fewer students now who are enrolled in higher ed than two years ago. And this is partially a product of COVID, but you had the whole demographic cliff thing um, also going on. In, in other words, 18 years ago, people just weren't having that many children, right, who would come up into be of college age now. And so that's a big worry at our institution. The emphasis is on, Terry mentioned retention, you know, student retention is a really big issue too. How do we keep the students that we have and stop them from leaving? There's so many options for students these days. And so when Mike and I went to college, you know, state school in Florida, 
there just weren't as many options. I mean, I, I applied to, you know, I think I applied to UF, uh, New College, Rice, and University of Colorado Boulder, you know, just kind of randomly at these schools. But now you have so many different options. You have all the online options. And I just worry that the students aren't coming anymore. They're deciding to do other things with their time. And college has gotten very expensive, obviously, too. I mean, we're a state school and the tuition and board is like 20 grand a year, which in my mind, that still sounds like a private school education to me because of my generational experience. And you compare that to some of the new models of you get a paid internship right out of high school yep. and you're guaranteed, you get $45,000 a year and you're guaranteed a job on the other right. end. Those models are pretty appealing, especially if you're an 18 year old and you might not even get through and you're going to be burdened with debt if you do wind up going to higher ed. And we're also losing the males in particular. I mean, if you look at the, if you look at, at the gender breakdown, it's the males who aren't coming. Yeah. And so it's, there has been a gender imbalance in higher ed for a long time, but it's become even more you know, skewed towards women. And some people are very concerned about that if you sort of assume you know, kind of the, the, the heterosexual kind of normative model of that college has been a place where a lot of women will meet their future husbands and partners and so on and so forth. That's not happening as much anymore. Yeah. Right. I want to bridge it back to Tarlin because one of the interesting things that I haven't seen a lot of work done on is the impact of what's happening in college sports and men. And because of Title IX, we're seeing actually a reduction in men's sports because football takes such a huge number of bases. So if schools have a football program, they end up cutting a lot of other men's sports because they have to have equal access for women. And it's, like, it's not necessarily obviously sports that means men aren't going to college as much. The largest percentage of any group going to college these days is black women. Mm. Um, but they're also taking on a huge amount of debt. That's another thing that's playing into it. But to bring it back to the sports issue, I think that we're going to see more and more of a decline in football because it's too expensive at higher ed. And then just, you know, problematic in terms of having, you know, enough sports for both men and women. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. It's interesting because I had buddies who played college sports. They were ne were necessarily in the dominant sports. And then they're seeing reductions across the board. If you read, there are crazy articles about, not crazy, but parents who will start to get their kids early into certain sports where... Mm -hmm the squash and others, because that's the opportunity to get to college. And those opportunities are shrinking. If you're starting to prepare your, let's say your son early, they become almost like trying to get to the NBA to make it into one of these, the, the supply is shrinking across the board. Mm -hmm. And so then athletes, male athletes in particular, will start to point to Title Nine and saying that it's having impact on ability to get into college. So it's actually a topic, I, a, Paul, you and I have talked about one. I want to talk about the women's soccer and yeah. what's happened with the national team. But this is definitely a topic, Terry, you want to talk about. You may get an ask to join us to have this conversation, <laughs> especially as I know you're a former track athlete. I do want to touch on something you said that I, I don't want you to be afraid, but you should be a little afraid. And my Fear back, is a good thing, right? My back Fear is a great motivator. Yeah, I went to the college board September 2020. Interesting going to a 600 person organization where you don't meet anyone for about 12 to 15 months. And I went in because I have a background. I used to run boot camps, And if you've heard of boot camps, they 12, 16 weeks, you te teach adult learners how to code. And those are helping individuals cycle into the job today and tomorrow. There's a stat back in 2015, there'll be a million open software jobs and you're only producing 40,000 consumer science grads a year. So how are we filling those jobs? And the Individuals who would come to us, they had, um, you know, backgrounds in various colleges. They had great degrees, but they were massively in debt. And they were like, I just, I'm going to take off my, this 12 weeks and then try to cycle into a new career. So when I went to interview at the college board, I asked 13 people whether or not everyone should go to college. And the best thing answer I got was from the former president of Vassar. She said, everyone should be able to have an opportunity to go to college independent of who their parents are but it doesn't mean their first step should be to college. So I talk about the first step. If you use an SAT, it's going digital, there's test optional versus test blind. I think the test optional movement giving students choice is an unbelievable, that's all you want is for students to have agency in this process, which I have a ninth grader, soon to be 10th grader. She's still, she's talking about what they wanna see on my resume, what they wanna see to go to school. So I just love the fact of giving students choice. 
If you use the SAT as a proxy, 45% of students who take the SAT are deemed college ready, yet 72% go. We have been marketed since the 60s that like, you need to go to college in or order to win. Mm. So those who don't go to college and someone says, I'm gonna take a gap here, I'm gonna do something else, it's almost as if they're already losing. And so it's funny, when I interviewed with these 13 people, there is a receptivity and we are, this is my group, Big Future, going after the ability for someone to understand their path post high school. So we have restructured, we've had a big future college planning tool since 2007. I've come in, we're really restructuring, we're uh, making better wayfinding on our sites. If you go to big future, there's plan for college, pay for college and explore careers. Because why can't a student at some point, which doesn't exist today say, you know what, I'm really, if they take the SAT, instead of our PSAT, instead of getting a score report back that says practice more. What if it said, you're interested in science, did you know there's a two year certificate program in nursing in your area and you can make this amount of money? Mm. Why isn't that a win? Why isn't vocational is not a pejorative term. My dad is from a small town in Mansell that used to have two booming manufacturing facilities. There was a regular track, a vocational track and a college track. Now all Mansell, Ohio is known for it, the prisons there. Have you ever seen Shawshank Redemption? That's one of the prisons that's in Mansell, Ohio. So the, his buddies in the vocational truck, they were great. They were loved. They were going into factories. They were going to use their hands. They got great pension. They were, they were winning. My dad was the first one ever to go to college in the family, and he took a totally different path. We're trying to create that optionality for people. So you go vocational, you go two-year certificate, you go a boot camp. We're all winning because we're not all in the same path. And that, when I say you should be afraid, not everyone should go to college. It doesn't mean they're not capable. It doesn't mean that they're gonna, their life can't be great. But why can't you choose what makes the most sense? I talk about having click moments. Not everyone has a click moment. When I was five, I'm a son of a teacher, son of a lawyer. I always loved school. My, my mom said, you come home, you get a snack, you gotta do your work. My sister came home, who knows what the hell she was doing. Five, I came home, got a snack, had like a little assignment. I packed the homework in, in my backpack and put it at the front door. Mom said she never talked to me again. So people have click moments. It doesn't mean we all need to click. School doesn't, school sucks at times. Why am I studying this? So you should be taking students that are ready for that experience, that are ready to explore that class. I wish I was there to take your class. But other people, we need to create pathways and optionalities for them to do other things. Because that way, that's the way they win. I think yeah. you're exactly right. <laughs> There's also some reframing of the conversation too. Like where, if you look at how long we're living and the opportunities to re-engage and upskill, reskill, we have this, this notion of, you know, 18 to 22, 18 to 24 is this one window of time when you can actually get your upskilling and your, your education. When in reality, we all need to continue to upskill. I did want to open up to the audience because we're running out of time and we don't always have an audience. I know Tarlin did build rapport with the audience early. Hi, Lassie. I, I was also here, but he was building rapport. <laughs> and if anyone has questions, I, I believe we had a microphone somewhere. Or comments. I just want to chime in a little bit on the question of people go to college. And it's interesting because a lot of people will say, oh, college is passe. are the same ones who are sending their kids to the top of the colleges. So I think we have to be careful about that topic. Yeah, that's, I think that's a really good point. And if I could just piggyback on that a sec. Terry mentioned that the biggest group which is staying in college now is black women. So mm -hmm. I, I think it, it's kind of ironic and interesting and a little bit worrying to a certain extent that just when higher education is now becoming more inclusive and more representative of the population as a whole, now the elites and other people are pushing back and saying, oh, you don't need to go to college anymore. College doesn't have value and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Terry, I understand and agree with you. Just real quick. I do have refrigerator magnets if people ask questions. So I just <laughs> wanted to put that out there. Lacey has one right now, but please continue. But I 100% agree with you. It's um, going to the college where we were thinking about all students. So we actually have a segment on, called Real Talk where we actually have virtual, virtual events just for black students and families to understand what it means to go to college. So when I make that statement, I'll make it flippantly. I think college, I got so much from college. It's just, I think we label people if they don't make the step. And what frustrates me is people do make the step and then they don't, they don't finish, which means they have a year or two under the belt and massive amount of debt. And then they aren't able to then cycle that into 
what do I do with it? So it's a complicated clickbait statement. I'm just trying in the small realm that I'm in to make sure that people understand there are other ways, other things that may connect to their skill set, mm -hmm. whatever you're using to gauge their capabilities, yeah. whether it's an assessment or their readiness, whatever it is. Because the one thing I will say that, at least for my daughters, to go and just go to find yourself, I think that may be the statement where um, people feel more pressure to figure out what the return is. Yeah. And so longer conversation that, that there's nuance to should everyone go to college? Because I, I agree with what but, but the related point, and we do have an audience question, which is amazing, but the related point is uh, just exposing people to more career pathways throughout K-12 right on up. Like the sooner folks know what may ultimately turn into a career path for them, the better. But we have a question. So thank you. This is a great discussion. I'm Jen Lawrence is my name from Indiana University. And so I, I care a lot about college, the college experience. I guess my question is about what is the purpose of an education? Is it only about getting that job or the economic outcomes. Earlier in your conversation, you were talking about spaces for meeting people who are different from you. And for me, that's been like a really important part of what, a, what people are ready for at that time in life and what the kinds of spaces we need to put them in. You know, people can't graduate with tons of debt, but I'm curious about how we might imagine that happening because we're in crisis as a culture, you know, around that question, how could we imagine that happening if some of this path of doing that is in some ways eroding? Oh, so not having those spaces, and I, I'm hopefully everyone's back on campus now because I can only imagine everyone being isolated. You don't have these conversations. We actually have time to think and explore. I think it makes a ton of sense. We are not talking to each other. So you either talk through tweets or responding to articles that no one reads. So they're just responding to the top level of an article. I'm a big believer in school. I got a lot of college. I got a lot of my MBA. I learned more from the people that I met there and I use them as my own personal board of advisors. The question is not, it's not a, they shouldn't, it's a win. And to Mike's point, can you extend the opportunity, the cycle for when someone might think about becoming, learn, becoming a college, going to college, or can we truly be lifelong learners? You're making the biggest purchase decision of your life at 18 years old. And would, some, would it help someone if they actually knew there was a way to set themselves up differently if they're not ready? And that's what we're talking about. We're still in the, under my shield. We're still hoping to connect people to the best fit school, but we are missing out. If you look at the demographics and the people that we, we, we touch through our assessments and our APs, there's a whole swath of kids from rural backgrounds, first gen, black, Hispanic, that we're just not engaging and touching. And so that, that's when I'm talking about the broader, so I'm trying to think broader while still being one of the biggest proponents of higher education there can be, because it was just, it changed my, even as a, a class like philosophy of sports, I still remember writing the paper, digging, like that, that's just a level of discourse and thinking you just don't get if it's all about the career, but I'm also trying to mix the practical with the theory and with the learning. So hopefully that's answering the question, but it's a, that's why I'm saying it's a nuance while we're trying to we're trying to look out for everyone. The last thing I want to do is see what is, a, I think, a very important institution or set of schools erode. It hurts me to see that. Yeah. And so the evolution then, as you see what's happening from a market perspective, how are the Indianas and others of the world like responding to at least understand, the, I call it the pain from the customer, and then figure out how, how to adjust. Hopefully that, I'm happy to talk more, but hopefully yeah, that. Yeah, and, and that philosophy of sports class opened you up to a career pathway as a future podcast. <laughs> but no, we have another question. Yeah. Just as you're, I, again, appreciate just like the, the other questioner of the conversation. My name is Ben. I'm an educator from Reno, Nevada. And it, just as you were all talking, I just, one thing that just kept coming up for me with this, which I'd like you to comment on is this concept of the myth of the meritocracy. I thought about the Brian Flores thing. One of the count, one of the things people say is, well, NFL teams just want to win. And if he was going to be the the one that won, they would be hiring that person. And which 
obviously neglects to understand that the peop- all the people who are hiring primar- are primarily white men, and there's an exclusionary piece there. But, but I guess if, what I want to, to bring up is, is education as a space of learning and passion and pursuit versus a space of systemic gatekeeping. And that, and I don't want to bring up the college board too much on this, but, you know, I, I, you know, there's, when you, as educators, we have an incredibly narrow scope of what really we value in, in terms of knowledge, in terms of skill sets. And, and those are selected intentionally and they're intentionally exclusionary and they've been historically intentionally exclusionary. I guess for me, I want to ask you, rethinking how we attach status and gatekeeping to education and how do we value knowledge that isn't maybe traditional, maybe systemically white middle-class knowledge? How do we expand that knowledge and expand how we value that? Mm -hmm. Number one, we have to be intentional and we have to get people to understand and agree that, you know, the status quo is not acceptable. And that's what I'm trying to do in my work of radical empathy, not saying everybody's a racist, but just that the structures we have in place do not lead to optimal outcomes, exactly as what you're saying. You have a situation where the NFL is not hiring the best coaches because they have a bias set in place. I said this earlier, we do the exact same thing at higher education. It's not necessarily that you just applied for the job and you were the best person. It's like, no, my, my advisor knows your advisor and they're going to say, oh, she's really great. You know, she's got a lot of potential and, and they're going to talk to each other and make sure that I get that interview. So part of the process is, first of all, acknowledging that those structures exist. And I would say we're still in that early stages of that. And, you know, we've tried through the courts and everything. And what it takes is which is why I wrote my book, The Roots of Racism, is for people like me. I'm first-generation college goer and all that, but I'm in a position of privilege to stand up here at, and I wish I was there personally because I'd be out in the hall when he's yelling and screaming and I could be, that we have to change in higher ed Mm. and that we acknowledge that the reasons that all these old white guys get the endowed chairs is not because they're the best researchers. It's because they, their buddies, if you go back to the 60s and 70s, the way people got hired in higher ed was, Literally, this advisor would send their student to their buddy and they would hire them to be a professor. And now those guys are all the ones who are in the senior positions are, you know, in the position to be the gatekeepers for me to get tenure or full professor or, or all that. And so it takes very conscious, intentional efforts. And I can talk about the American Political Science Association, you know, creating structures for our black faculty and doing the research and making sure that we are you know, using the tools we have, the legal and the, the political and all these different tools we have. But we're in an extremely difficult environment right now where we're getting all this backlash against things like what is basically against history and critical thinking. Right. I want to call it what they try to call it. And so if you're getting people saying we don't even want to teach history and critical thinking in the schools, it makes it that much harder to do that work. But the reality is I'm calling for all people of goodwill to get out there, especially white people, because you have more privilege and be out in front and call it as you see it and make sure that we are doing things in a way that allows for, you know, we need to change the whole taxing structure so that K through 12 is, is properly funded and then, you know, stop the under underfunding of uh, higher education. We're actually in a stage where we're just trying to preserve these things right now because they're under such horrible attacks. Yeah. We all have to step up and vote and make sure that we're telling our politicians, don't listen to these, you know, five parents over here, listen to the thousands of parents over here who want their kids to get a good education. We're getting close to time, but I would say the other space to, to look at is the, the private sector, boot camps, you know, a lot of the, the stuff that, that Tarlin was talking a little bit about earlier. If you look at how many open Salesforce jobs there are, how, how many open mm-hmm. HubSpot jobs there are out there, are you going to go to UT Austin to learn HubSpot or are you going to get hired by HubSpot to fill their open roles or get hired by Amazon to get your AWS training? So this is the, the point I think Tarlin was making about encouraging Dan's fear. Like, higher ed is in more of an existential threat position than I think it's ever been before. And I just say that one, that's a, that's a great book Um, to the fear is not because you want it to go away. It forces change and it forces a collaboration that may not happen in the past. So that's what I mean. 
I want the institutions to be there, to be vibrant. It's how we're strong and right. how it creates opportunity for everyone. But they're just going to be appendages to it right. that you may not get everyone at first shot coming out of high school. And that's okay. Right. You may open up and say, but I'm going to get you, I, I have a way to engage with you later. Or you have public-private partnerships. Yeah. That's what I mean. And I think you're, what you mentioned, engagement, I think, is what it's all about. Because I think many of the students who are coming up today, you know, I mean, 18 to 22, I mean, that's, that's a very delicate time. It's a time when people go through a lot of change. And I think that's part of what question was the idea of like college being a rite of passage, right? So it's not just about getting the credentials and getting the job, but it's all about you trying to figure out your pathway, your destiny in life. And I think to, to your point, Tarlin, we need more people connecting with the younger generation at an earlier point to, to help them and guide them so they can figure out exactly what to do. Yeah. But they're not necessarily getting it in the K through 12 system and they're not necessarily getting it in higher ed either. And I think your point, yeah, the myth of meritocracy, I think you're exactly right. We have more and more students graduating with debt, 37,000 now in debt. Yeah. It takes a long time to pay that off, you know. The other thing I've heard you talk about, Tarlin, is the entrepreneurial spirit and how particularly educators who are here at this conference are of that mindset, be the change you want to see. There are ways in which you can actually affect change at a local level, particularly if you have those touch points with the rising generations. Even some of the stuff that Dan was doing around writing this book about a blues club. There's a level of risk that you took on and entrepreneurial mindset. I, I think the idea that you get a safe gig and you can just ride it, both for those of us middle generations on up, but then also for the rising generations, those days are gone. And I, I just think education has been a little bit insulated, so may not necessarily have felt the fire. But I do feel like the last couple of years have really turned that upside down. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you to our panelists. Thanks to our audience. Thank you, Terry. My pleasure. You'll be here next year. All right. And with that, we'll bring this episode of Trending in Education to its conclusion. Thanks again to everyone at South by Southwest EDU, Ron Reed, Greg Rosenbaum, Liz Stein. Couldn't have done it without y'all. And of course, thank you to Tarlin Ray, Dan Harrison, and Terry Givens, who have been fantastic collaborators with me over the last two years, weathering the pandemic and continuing to crank out content. It was amazing to get with people in person, to ease my way back into a conference experience. Hopefully things continue to move in the right direction and we can get together a little bit more and benefit from the serendipity of the conference experience. I know I certainly felt that way coming away from South by Southwest EDU. Let us know what you're thinking. Write us a review, tweet at us at Trending in Ed. We're at trendingineducation.com. We'll be back again soon. Thank you as always for listening. This is Trending in Education. <laughs>